from Sioux Wheeler. We're based in Cape Town, um, South Africa. And yeah, I, I've come here not knowing too much about um, Wikipedia. Um, we're uh, more aligned with um, Creative Commons, and that's how I've kind of been introduced into the whole world of, of Wikimedia and understanding what goes on behind the scenes. And it's been yeah, a really great experience just to, to learn um, about this, this um, complicated world which, which exists and, and which is uh, growing. And yeah, what I want to just talk about today is, is um, more focus on open education and uh, what we're doing at Tiabula. And a lot of um, our processes and just the way that we do things are very much aligned with um, the Wikimedia Foundation. So just to start off with, with some of um, the sort of context and challenges that we're dealing with in South Africa, and this is, I'm sure, applicable to the whole of Africa is that we have a wide range of contexts and, and as you can see from some of these photographs these are some of the schools that we, we deal with um, and even the schools which have even less resources that are, that are shown in some of these, these pictures and they don't even have um, proper classrooms and then for example this school at the bottom here is a, a private school in Cape Town um, which we interact with a lot and um, well here they all, each child is required to have a MacBook but now each child has an iPad so um, just just to give an idea of, of the diversity of, of context in South Africa. But just to point out that all of these are challenging and all of these contexts um, have their, their indi individual challenges and each child um, still deserves a chance. And what we really believe is that opening up access to education and specifically resources will help and also help to bridge the gap between these, these um, diverging contexts. So just to, just to um, talk about open education a bit, um, it has been mentioned and, um, and the main um, sort of goal of open education is to break down the barriers um, to, uh, which are access to access education. And those barriers can be, can be anything, they can be cost, they can be um, a technolo technological barrier, internet, um, infrastructure, actually having a, um, a building, um, yeah, anything that's a, that's a barrier to education. And then open educational resources fall under open education. And these are actually um, any resources that can be used for teaching, learning, or research um, that reside in the public domain or have been used under um, another alternative license which enables freedom and reuse, such as Creative Commons. And um, I'm sure a lot of you really know about Creative Commons and we had the event last night. And basically, um, these licenses enable um, freedoms rather than just imposing restrictions. And um, open educational resources um, can be anything. They can be a textbook, they can be videos on YouTube, um, Wikipedia can be used as an open educational resource. Um, so they're, they're hugely diverse. And what we mostly focus on at Seabula is open textbooks. So what I just want to look at is, is what, what we're doing in South Africa and, um, and how we're aiming to, to increase access to education through, through OER. So Siagula is an Nguni word, which means we are opening. And quite a few people have already asked me here at this conference what Siagula means. And, um, and it it's really means a lot to us because it's, um, it's recognized in um, a lot of the official languages in South Africa. And so we're a social enterprise and we see ourselves built on these um, three foundations of community, technology and openness. And we're working to make high quality educational resources available to every learner and teacher in South Africa. Um, so just to give an overview of the content that we've done so far, we align to the curriculum so that it's, um, it's been government approved and so teachers and learners can use it in the classroom, they know that this is what they have to um, be covering in a year. Um, our textbooks are, are collaboratively authored, I'll speak a bit more about that just now. Our focus is, um, is, is at school level, grade 4 to 12, and we're predominantly maths and science focused, although we are going to be branching out. And the, such, the languages that we focus on are English and then we translate into Afrikaans. And some of our, our textbooks have actually um, been translated into Isi Tosa, especially the grade four to six resources um, in the Eastern Cape. There's a project there at the moment. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly what they need from us. Um, they've taken our resources and, and translated them into Isi Tosa because they still have um, a lot of schools which have stuck with mother tongue instruction 
up until grade six rather than switching to, um, to English in grade four for natural sciences because they feel it's, it's more beneficial. And because of the open license of our, our content, they're um, fully able and allowed to just take our content and translate it. And these are just the websites that we, we have all of our content available on. So we have printed textbooks, but then you can access all the contents on these, these websites. So we have a different website for each phase in the um, education system. Um, I put these slides up on, on SlideShare as well, which I, I tweeted and I'll send around again. So if anyone wants to, to get hold of the, the content. Then at CFULA, we um, strongly believe that technology enables and enriches. So not only do we have uh, print resources, as in South Africa and, and around Africa, printed textbooks are still um, very important, but we also have all of our content available um, on the web, on mobile, and then also on Mixit. And um, I'm not sure how many people know of Mixit, but it's a chat room service available in South Africa. And it's very popular amongst the youth, and especially um, youth in, in the more rural areas, as it's, um, you can use them on low-end feature phones. So we put all of our content on Mixit, and, um, and yeah, kids can access it and read it, read it over Mixit um, for almost, it almost costs nothing. It's a few cents, uh, less than a few cents per message. And um, yeah, we have over 800,000 learners reading our content on mobile phones every month. So that's, that's huge for us, and it's growing every month. And then also in the content, we embed videos and simulations. So um, we're trying to bring the content to life, not just make it a static textbook. So in the printed textbooks, there'll be a link which kids can go and type in online. But then if they're obviously they're looking at it on their phones, they can just play the video or the simulation within the content. And what we're trying to do by that is actually make it easier for teachers to also implement technology in the classrooms. So I just want to speak a bit about how we actually create our open textbooks. And I think it speaks to the, the Wikimedia Foundation at large as well as we completely believe in collaborative authoring and um, through this building up the community. So we lead very open and transparent processes and we believe this has maximum impact. So the way that um, we've kind of converged on producing our open textbooks. As, as you can see in some of these photos, we, um, we hold workshops with um, a group of volunteers at the start of a textbook writing process. And these can be um, their teachers, their postgraduate students, their um, academics at university, curriculum advisors, even some government officials have actually come to these initial sort of brainstorming workshops. And, um, yeah, we really found these really beneficial and teachers, um, all, everyone that's participated has really gained a lot from it. And the idea is to actually sit down and discuss the curriculum as, um, as you can see this, we're sitting around these sort of maps. So what I did for the natural sciences is create a, a map of, of the content for, that they need to cover. And then we'll sit and we'll discuss ideas, share best practices for introducing this topic in the classroom. And all of that gets documented, and it's kind of our starting point for then um, authoring the textbook. We then um, go away, and a core group, or, so the content that I've done, I'll work with a core group of people um, to actually develop the content in the first draft. And then as soon as that's ready, in the chapters, we open it up to the community again, and we invite their, their feedback and their, um, their input. And this can be in a multi uh, multiple ways. They can either um, just be proofreading, say if they don't have any science or math background, but they're good at um, English language, they can proofread for grammar, they can look for um, scientific errors, they can give additional sort of resources or um, ideas for activities. And um, yeah, we've really found that this um, process actually helps to, to build a community around the textbook. And then we also use um, volunteers for translation when we actually translate into Afrikaans. So some of the benefits of this collaborative OER um, production is that, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have such a diverse range of, of contexts in South Africa. And we are trying to produce one textbook, which um, we want to be as relevant to as many people as possible. And obviously we're not going to satisfy all the needs of the whole country, but we're trying to um, make it as, as relevant as possible. So having people from diverse backgrounds involved in the actual production of the book really gets some insight into some of those contexts that we wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, even if it's just suggesting an alternative material for an activity, like you don't always need 
um, conical flasks and cylinders, you can use margarine tabs um, from the kitchen. So some of those sort of examples have been really great to include in the books just to make it more accessible. And then, um, yeah, we also get absolute sort of scrutiny of the content, which I'm sure a lot of you realize from, from Wikipedia. And as soon as someone suggests even one sort of minor correction to a spelling error, they now feel that they're an author of this textbook and they take complete ownership of it. So that's, that's been really great. And um, the more eyes that go through the content, the less errors are actually slip through. And then in terms of um, volunteering, we're also providing a space for people to give back meaningfully to education in South Africa. So I think when people volunteer, they want to actually see that their contributions have an impact. And, um, and we're providing that, that platform for people to actually contribute meaningfully. And then also um, in the production of the OBR, it's starting to build a community around these open textbooks, which lasts much longer than just the production. So we actually starting to um, yeah, build a community which will support the continued revisions of the textbook, it will support its implementation in classrooms, um, it will even, we've seen communities which are now um, taking the textbooks and adapting them to their, suit their own needs, um, for example the, the Independent Board um, Examinations Board in South Africa which runs the private schools, they've taken our physical sciences textbooks um, which are aligned to the government curriculum, but they've adapted it and aligned it to suit their own um, standard assessment guidelines. And they, they did that completely um, as a spin-off of being involved in our sort of collaborative authoring uh, production. And we had one, um, we're calling her almost like a community leader, who we've been involved with a lot, and she's been driving that, and she has been facilitating the process. Yeah, so all well, this is exactly what I was talking about, starting to seed communities of open practice. Um, and we've seen lots of spin-offs of, of people being involved in um, collaborative authoring of, of OER. They're starting to understand the benefits of, of open licenses um, and open education, because a lot of people, that volunteers that come and get involved in, in our workshops, they most of them have no idea about the open movement before they get there. So we always start off with some um, introductions and play some games and, and think about open education, open licenses. And yeah, it's, it's really been a great place for people to start sharing ideas and, um, and, yeah, and building also skills. They've also seen this as a professional development exercise. And sometimes when we've had workshops, they normally run over the weekends, but if teachers have to take a Friday off, they've started to motivate that this is actually improving their skill set and, and headmasters are starting to recognize this, which is really great. And um, yeah, and then like I said, we want people to take our, our textbooks. Um, they might have been involved in, in production of our textbooks or, or heard about them and start adapting them um, to suit their, their very local um, needs, which, which are even, um, like I said, very diverse within South Africa. And then we also um, really believe in recognizing the community. So this is a, a screenshot of um, the front um, page of our, one of our physical sciences textbooks. And as you can see, that whole long list is all the volunteers that have been involved in the production of this book. And it's not just South Africa. We have volunteers from all over the world that, that get involved, um, especially obviously um, during the online um, phase when, when you don't have to, we don't actually run workshops and they can just help proofread or anything like that. And yeah, and, and they really get excited about seeing their name in the front of a textbook. Um, and then we've taken that one step further, and I'm not sure if people here know about the open badge system. Um, so badges are a way of um, accrediting alternative skills that you might have got which are outside of, um, of like an academic institution, like a university or a um, a technicon or something like that. So we've started to give badges to specific people who made a, a significant contribution. And um, so not just, if everyone gets recognized in the front of the textbook, but not everyone will get a badge, just those people that we really feel have um, contributed significantly. So yeah, at Sea Villa we, we don't just, we believe in open everything, so open, our processes are very open, and we make them as transparent as possible, um, they're collaborative, we use open copyright licenses, um, all of our content is um, available under the CC BY attribution license. Um, we believe in open standards, because um, these formats will enable freedoms, and then um, open source software, so 
um, we all use um, Ubuntu and Office and GitHub and really embracing that sort of open movement in everything that we do. So what does this do? Well, firstly, um, we've really found that it's, it strengthens the work that we, that we do. And um, the way it's doing this is helping to build a community. I mean, as we've been speaking a lot about this weekend, community is, um, is, is really important to success and sustainability of a project. And um, this also facilitates people starting to use and adopt the textbooks and content in the classroom. Um, it's starting to, by opening up um, and having our textbooks online, it's also starting to have a broader impact in South Africa and also beyond. So we're having, um, yeah, we have people that are using our content all over the world um, as they are, and some people have even adapted them. I mean, lots of people in the States and Fiji and Finland. We, we constantly we even had, we shipped some textbooks to Norway. So, no, it's, it's been really great. And then, yeah, by having an open and transparent process and involving government right from the beginning, they're also starting to understand the benefits of open policy and open licenses. And we're now interacting with governments um, very closely and, and they're really starting to, to see the benefits of, of open policy. Um, yeah, the general public, like I said, it's, it's an opportunity for them to get involved in an education project with huge impact. And then the educators that are that are involved in the project and also use the, the textbooks are starting to to learn about um, open resources and what this means. And it's a, it's a very slow process trying to educate people about open licenses. And it's the, the first thing they understand is that it's free. But then to take that one step further and to actually understand that they can um, what they can do with this textbook or this resource because of the open license. And then lastly. Um, the sort of area that we're really seeing an impact in is obviously the learners. So um, we've had amazing feedback from, from learners all over South Africa, um, mostly on our Facebook page, that's where we interact with them a lot. So if you, if you check that out, we're constantly getting um, um, sort of um, feedback from them and saying that they, they really love the work that we're doing. Um, they recognize that it's written by volunteers and it's amazing how the learners actually really respond um, well to that, the fact that um, this book is collaboratively authored. Um, they really like that. And, um, and then also that they're engaging with the, a living resource, that there's actual people behind this. It's not just a static textbook which they buy one year and it's out of date the next year. And um, yeah, and they're also something that I've been really wanting to instill in learners from a young age is this idea of open. And by using an open textbook, they're really starting to understand what open licenses are. and. Um, where possible, just very subtly, we'll include links in the textbook to a little video about open education or um, or any sort of open source software that we might have used that they might also want to use. So just trying to to get kids on board about the open movement, so that by the time they they leave school and they enter into university, they know what's the, they know what's available, they know what's out there, what they what they can access, that they don't just have to buy this really expensive publishing house textbook. That there are alternative options. And you'll start to get like a, or I believe that a, a bottom-up pressure on, on academics to, to start switching and using open textbooks and open resources. Um, so lastly, just, well not lastly, something that um, I mentioned is that we work um, very closely with governments. And this has been a, a, a slow process getting started and um, how it came about was back in, um, it was the end of 2010, or beginning of 2011, there, there were um, teacher, massive teacher strikes in South Africa. And the Department of Basic Education called us, just at the office one day, and they found out about our resources that we had, um, which were quite low-key at that point, the grade 10 to 12 maths and physical science textbooks. And they said um, they'd like to print these for the whole country. Um, but at that stage, they just changed the curriculum. So our books weren't completely aligned, so we had to rework the content in 10 days um, and make sure that it was aligned and we had a fully proofed PDF file to give the governments. Um, and that was when we called on volunteers from around the world and we, we got it done. We had over 100 people um, contributing um, in those 10 days to get the books up to scratch. And um, yeah, and then they printed them for the whole country. So that was 2.8 million books which were printed um, and distributed. Um, which was which was really exciting for us, and that's kind of kickstarted the process. And um, 
Yeah, and then since then, the content that I've produced, which is um, more focused on natural sciences and branching into primary school, grade four to six, and then grade seven to nine, um, that's a much bigger phase, because um, all kids are obviously doing grade four to six um, natural sciences. And yeah, so we, we made, we produced workbooks for that. And since then, uh, yeah, the government also printed those books last year. And they printed about, yeah, was about six million books um, um, for the country. And then, yeah, so going forward, we actually um, have made this relationship more formal now with government. And we have a, um, an MOU with them that anything that we produce going forward now, they've agreed to review and endorse for national distribution. And um, this won't necessarily be on a, um, government's not going to be printing it anymore because um, those initial printing came out of this, a special fund that the Department of Education had. But what they'll do is that our textbooks will go onto an open um, list of textbooks, which will sit alongside the approved list um, that other publishing houses have to get onto, that provinces can then choose to print off. So, um, so how it would work is that schools still have the choice um, of choosing a, a traditional textbook, which they normally um, would have chosen uh, before that, which can go for up to 200 rand per book. Or if they choose um, one of our textbooks, which has been reviewed um, extensively and we've had really good feedback, we know it's high quality, and at the, the mass sort of production uh, printing that we'll be doing, we can print those books for less than 50 rand a book in full colour. So it's a, it's a huge saving, and we're advocating for um, how schools and provinces can now use that, those funds, and um, sort of, because it's one thing just to, to use a, to, use your funds for something else, but then if those funds aren't allocated to something beneficial, they can, they can just be, be lost in the system. Um, and what we've worked out is that um, if, if every child has a, a textbook of um, an open open title um, for five, five of their subjects, that saving um, enables them to buy a tablet for the child. So, um, so it, it really is a significant saving. Um, so what we're doing is at Tia is we're really branching out our, our production of open titles um, um, into other subjects and also making sure that we cover um, maths and science completely from grade 4 to 12. Um, this will be implemented over the next three years. Um, how we do is we get funding for this is we actually look for, for sponsors and partnerships. Um, and because the, the books will have such a widespread distribution, um, big corporates in South Africa and also some international corporates have sponsored, well not internationally yet, but we have some interest in actually sponsoring a, a title and they get their logo on the front cover and on our website and that's huge um, advertising and corporate social investment for them. Um, and then yeah, we're also actually working with government and interacting with them about um, open policy. And then yeah, just some of our, our challenges at Siabula which I think has, has come up numerous times, times here yeah, with what everyone faces with is um, the technology. So actually finding um, suitable platforms, um, especially for editing. Um, we, we want to put our content up online so that people can create derivative works, but finding an online um, editor and developing that has been um, a long, slow process, but we are actually um, starting to um, sort of crystallize a process and, there's a, an editor that's been developed in, in Houston, in Texas, that we're working very closely with called the OER Pub. And um, this is something where we will make our textbooks available online and where people can go and create um, derivative versions. Then also creating awareness, um, as I'm sure you all um, are unique, um, very aware of, just about the, the availability of the textbooks and then also about um, what open actually means. Um, and then, yeah, looking at sustainability and also creating um, business models around the fact that we're giving half or most of our stuff away for free is <laughs> quite tricky. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a global sort of movement of, of looking at how you can actually um, create um, money around, around things that are, that are made open. And I think the movie that we watched last night, The Pirate Bay, really, really speaks to this, the fact that we, we need new business models that are um, looking at um, innovative businesses that are that are open and really, um, yeah, just embracing where the internet and where, where we're going. So, yeah, so that's something that we're really all working towards at Seville, and I think we're 
It's just at that cusp of, of figuring it out exactly. So then, so please don't hesitate to contact me, and there's my, my email, and, um, and also, yeah, I'll put the slides up on, on SlideShare if anyone would like to reference them. Thanks. Especially the, the more um, top end schools, so um, th those are the, the markets that we're really sort of struggling to convince um, because they have the money, they, they're not they're not battling to, to choose. But um, so what we have to do is convince them of the, of the quality of our resource. So if the quality is, is equal, or, um, often we've had feedback that the quality is even higher, then they'll go for the um, the cheaper book. And also then educating them about um, that, that this is not just a, a money saving, but if they start to use this book. It's available on mobile phones, kids can access it after class. Um, there's so much more than just being, being a textbook. And, um, yeah, but obviously schools that are uh, much more under-resourced, I don't think it's a, it's a question for which textbook they would go for. Uh, firstly, I think it's a really cool project. My brother told me about it, but I didn't know the details. And sorry, I was in Joburg PD, so I came in uh, a little bit of the way through. Could you explain, uh, I didn't get, or I wasn't sure when you, if you talked about how you make them cheaper, the books, firstly, mm -hmm. and secondly, uh, I see you have a focus on science and maths, which is obviously a governmental focus as well, um, but uh, are you branching out to other textbooks uh, and other um, subjects? Mm -hmm. And if so, uh, chat to me, because I know an old historian who was involved in rewriting history textbooks uh, post apartheid, so he might, if he has time, be interested in something like this. Okay, great. Um, yeah, just so your first question about actually making them cheaper. So, firstly, the fact that they're under an open license, so we don't pay any of our authors royalties. Um, the authors that are commissioned, they just get paid upfront for the work that they're going to do, and um, so there's no sort of long term earning a living off, off, off these textbooks. So, just the fact that there's no royalties um, hugely cuts down the cost. And then, um, yeah, and then, so we, we get sponsorships from, from big corporates who fund the, the production of the books. So we're not looking to, to make a profit off these books. They're, they're only licensed. You can download them for free, but if you want a, a printed textbook, the fact that we're printing them in such high volume, um, two million books at a time, means that um, just the it's sort of a practical constraint of the printers that they actually use at the printing houses, they can do it at a much cheaper, um, cheaper okay. rate. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, other subjects, yeah, like I said, we really are going to be um, branching out from math and science. So, um, CEDU has its origins at the, in the physics department at UCT, so we have always been heavily biased towards sciences and then maths, and now we're starting to, to incorporate the other sciences, like, um, well, since I've been there, because I'm doing more natural sciences and um, my background's in biology. And yeah, and we've had a lot of requests for other subjects like accounting, geography, and we, we are going to be more sort of on the science side focused, but um, in future we, we're definitely looking to, to expand to a much wider range of subjects. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's something that we are very much uh, wanting to do in the future. And, um, we have been chatting to a few people in, in different countries and um, we were chatting about Ghana just now and I think it would be it would be really awesome if we could sort of replicate this in other countries and um, and because these are books are under open license, this these books provide a, a really great starting point for any, any country to take them and then align them to their curriculum, even if they just need to, to add in a few concepts, take some out, um, switch some, reorder something. But we have the, the bulk of the, the content already, and, and yeah, we're really um, looking, we would really love to, to be doing that. Yeah. Anyone else? 
Okay. Uh, last time I presented a portion of you, this project mm -hmm. as something successful to be adopted and they challenged me from technology aspect, whether it is feasible or not. Um, and the other is, how do you keep the students intact, having uh, games and other distracting tools on the tablets or the phone? And the other thing is, is there a local language format for this? Because we have primary schools they take on their native language. Thank you. Um, yeah, so like I said, the technology has also been a, um, a barrier for us, especially um, when we want to run workshops, just getting you know, people up to date with the technology that we use. But we've tried to make it as accessible as possible across a range of um, different devices. Um, so like I said, it's on Mixit, which is, um, it doesn't require much um, technology in terms of your, um, your phone. It works on very low end feature phones. And um, yeah, so I think I think just also having you, you, it's always going to come with some education around how to actually use this, this content, um, especially with teachers. And then um, yeah, in terms of I mean, we chat to schools a lot about using our, our contents in the classrooms, and a lot of schools in South Africa now are looking at um, in, in using tablets, making them part of their, their curriculum. And each school that we interact with has a different policy on how, how kids are allowed to use um, devices in the classroom. So some schools don't allow the mobile phones at all, some they're allowed to use them, some they actually really restrict what kids can access over the internet. So, so it really is dependent on the school. And um, yeah, um, well, personally, I think at Siabula we, we encourage them to, 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 in a, to use devices in the classroom. Kids are, are doing it anyway outside of school. So, um, so incorporate that into how they're learning um, and make it make it exciting so that they're not going and looking at a game during your classroom, um, during your teaching, so that they're actually engaging with um, something worthwhile in front of them. Um, and then, what, was, what did you, did you have something else that you asked? Oh, the local languages, yeah. So, um, yeah, like I said, we, we mostly focus on English and Afrikaans. Um, that's the two sort of subjects that that government um, requires as well, and it's the, um, the most common languages that are, are taught in, in schools. But um, yeah, like I said, up until grade three, um, most most schools do teach in, in mother tongue instruction, but then from grade four on they switch to English. But there are some schools which have chosen to stay with mother tongue instruction, especially in, um, in the sciences. As they, and I also believe that there is some benefit of learning in your mother tongue um, a new um, um, subject first for a while and then transition slowly because in grade four they they switch to English they're learning a new language plus they're now having to learn a completely new subject and it's it's really overwhelming and that's where we get this huge um, disparity in, in um, literacy in South Africa and um, yeah so so we we don't personally translate into other local languages but we, we really um, would encourage others other groups um, such as is happening in the Eastern Cape to actually take this content and, and translate it, and we would facilitate them, that process. And um, we use an online translation tool called Transifix, which we found to be um, really useful. And if, if someone else wanted to translate into a language um, outside of South Africa, um, we could easily sort of enable that, um, that process if you had a local community um, that's strong in that language, and then we would upload the content and then you can translate it yourself into your own language. Again, thank you.